Uh, I'm Mike Houghton, the president of the Uniform Law Commission. This is the uh, final panel of the afternoon. Uh, I appreciate everyone who has stuck with us, sticking with us. Uh, there have been some excitement. There has been some excitement in fireworks. I thought our luncheon speaker was incredibly entertaining. I think Bart was wondering uh, whether or not we uh, uh, withstood it all. And I thought, you know, my own view is that there are diverse views throughout the country. We don't want this to be an echo chamber, and I found Senator Rich to be uh, entertaining, and, uh, and, and it was a very useful uh, side of the, uh, the uh, debate to hear. Um, this afternoon on the final panel, uh, we have, uh, again, Tom Pirelli, uh, Mike Scodro, uh, Catherine Sharkey, and, and Senator uh, Gary Stevens. I'd like to begin, uh, I was going to begin by asking everybody to sort of give me their digested version of what they've heard this afternoon, but but really what I, what I like to try to do is just follow up uh, on some of the issues that we were just discuss discussing here about the the pragmatic reality of federalism. Um, no knock on our academic friends, but there's the there's the sort of academic take on it, which is a review of the law, a synthesis of where we are, how the law has developed. Uh, but but are we all talking again sort of in an echo chamber and by that i mean let's think about the political reality of the system and what we've talked about today i remember 18 months ago when some of us went up to the hill to meet with some members of the uh, house and senate judiciary committee catherine you were there we had a meeting with a, a senior house staffer who had been there for many years and he essentially said what chris and others have said today about federalism which is that federalism is the tool you use to win what you want and to defeat what you want. And knowing that as sort of an embedded reality in the debate of public policy, how do we address that? I mean, what, what, how, how do you deal with the fact that, and I thought the senator was very candid, you know, I'll, I'll do what I need to do if other people are doing the same thing on their side of the equation to advance or defeat a cause. So I'm going to ask you, Tom, in the first instance, what's your reaction to that and what's your sense of how you, you know, not as an academic issue, but as a practical political issue, what do we do? So the meta question is, how do you fix Washington? Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you've got about three minutes. Okay, well, you These know. These part of the problem. Yeah, so you have I to not be part of, of the solution. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I tried to be part of the solution, but yeah, I understand that. Um, I, I, one of the things that I preach when I have left, uh, when I was in government, and frankly, since I've left, left government, is... Um, engagement, um, much greater engagement, um, and much and, and more energy and effort around building coalitions. Uh, and I and I say this from having sat at the Justice Department and had a very substantial position uh, dealing with all manner of other issues, and lots of people sent would would fire off a letter, but the number of of, of Corporate groups, even corporate groups, nonprofit groups, the states, whatever, whatever, who actually sort of organized and said, "We want to, we want to have a long-term discussion with you about these three things. This isn't something we're going to solve today. This isn't something we're going to solve tomorrow. But um, we need to figure out how to get a handle on X, Y, Z, or P, D, Q." Well, let me let me ask you about that. Why do you think that happens? I mean, I, I lobby in part for a living. I'm retained by clients to advance issues. I'm just curious as to, and and I know you do that now. Yeah. So what, I don't what? lobby. It's against the law for me to lobby, so I do not do that. Okay. Well, you, you're an advocate in whatever appropriate That's form right. you can be. Yeah, but, but, but um, why do you think that there is that sort of fire off a letter and I've covered my base and that's enough to advance the interest? Is it, is it lack of resources, lack of interest? Because people who do this well really know what it takes to do it well. Right. Uh, and I do think that's right. I think it is a combination. Uh, there's certainly lack of resources, you know, but, it, but like I said, even sort of big corporate interests who would be a natural, they have the money, yeah. right? They didn't, they, they didn't do this in a way that I think you could. Right. Um, I think it is, there's certainly frustration with Washington, but also sort of not knowing where or how to engage. And then also, I think there's an element of of sort of short-term thinking, which is none of these problems actually will get resolved in a two-hour meeting, right. right? And so, but it is it is this sort of kind of sustained engagement that you need. And then the other thing, and I, I, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, well, well, let me let me segue into something slightly different, which is 
I'm sure there's, you know, I missed a lot bunch of the afternoon. I'm sure there was a lot of discussion of the law and case law. One of the things that I think sitting from inside the Justice Department where you're trying to figure out the United States position on a bunch of matters right. is, um, particularly in a world where conflict preemption is a primary uh, set of law that you have to deal with, um, that is all about uh, actually folks sitting down and talking about and trying to figure out, do we actually have a problem here or not? You know, one set of people may sort of draw the conclusion that the most technical inconsistency is a conflict. Another set of people may say, yeah, that doesn't really matter. And But those kind of things often, that discussion often occurs in an echo chamber inside the federal government. Right. Um, and so the, the level of discussion, which is not a, only when a brief is due in the Supreme Court discussion, but a long-term set of discussions, I think, um, it does not tend to happen at the levels at which you would want it to in government. And, and, and I, I'll be honest, you know, I go out and I talk to private clients about this all the time, that, they're, that they tend to, that they are not engaging at the place where they're likely to get um, a helpful result. So one takeaway for all of us here who are, are in this for hopefully the long term, as you said earlier, and I think you've just reiterated it, is to you know, determine what an effective advocacy plan is and frankly engage. I mean, you're either in or you're out. And if you want to be in it, you're going to be in it for the long term. I mean, when I hear Art Wilmarth go on about a 20-year-plus crusade, you know, in a very impassioned way, it's you've got to be in, these, in, this, in this battle for the long term. Now, Catherine, I'm going to ask you something that's not the same question, but I've got a list here, and I'm going to try to spread uh, my ideas around or my questions around. Uh, one of the other things that came up talking about the long term is, is this notion that um, you, you have the federal government either through legislation and or through regulation uh, advancing their issues, preempting either consciously or unconsciously, probably many times consciously. And I, I've heard a lot today about there needs to be um, engagement on the part of interested stakeholders. You need to possibly even create an infrastructure for a law firm to advance these issues there needs to be tenacity and energy. Do federal regulators consciously rely on the war of attrition that they know they can win when they go down this road? In other words, when there's a promulgation of regulations and they know there's a comment period, do they know that, and this is perhaps asking you to speculate, but you're, you've been around this issue, and Tom you've, and others have been around this issue certainly longer than I have, are they counting on that? Is it, is, is, it sort of a, is it sort of a federal preemptive strategy? And I don't mean to be critical of them, it's just it's a role perhaps they feel they play in the space that they occupy. And I was just interested in what your view might be, and if, and if you tell me that you think that maybe they do, what is the countervailing view on the part of state cooperative organizations uh, to that? That's a good question. I should say first, just for the record, I'm all in favor of knocking academics. I actually do it, you know, as part of my professional living. We, <laughs> we teach students where we get, and then we knock, mostly we get to talk to other academics. We try to knock their positions. It's a luxury to talk to sort of sophisticated, <laughs> real world players. And then in that setting, we still want to be knocked on because it just, it, we're not being ignored, right? We're being uh, engaged. Um, so let me, it's, it's a really, it's a very interesting question. I want to, um, I actually, I want to answer in part the first question and then come to the second, okay, too. Okay, that's fair. Go just ahead. because um, this is actually, for me, maybe a unique uh, issue in that the ACUS project I work on dr like dragged me into the pragmatic realities of things that I thought sort of abstractly and conceptually and written a law review article about. And I learned a lot from that experience. I learned first that I should stay where I am most of the, for my day job. And I'm not sure that my comparative advantage is in the trenches there. But... Um, but I think that some of the talk today, particularly about dysfunction, gridlock, et cetera, in Congress, the partisan nature, I too was thinking back to that uh, hearing wherein I thought they were unbelievably candid about federalism just being a tool that we pull out where it serves us one way or not. And yet, state interest groups, I think, consistently talk about pragmatic realities, are focusing their energies on Congress and moving Congress, and oftentimes ignoring federal regulators. So I said this years before in this report, maybe they should be turning their attentions and thinking about ways to engage, whether it's in the notice and comment process or other things. You know, Tom raised this question in his panel, and I think that the other, it's, it was important then, and it's even more important today, because 
rest assured, while Congress is dysfunctional and not moving, agencies are doing a lot of things. And so states can either hold back and react to what Congress may or may not do and try to influence them, or they can engage in sort of this process. You know, they might be maybe expecting the courts will hold fast and temper the agencies, but otherwise, you know, they don't engage in that process, I think, at their well, peril. Well, speaking just for a minute from the perspective of the National Conference Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, uh, we follow federal regulatory impact on state law, but we tend to think in the context, as you might think, as our name suggests, in law mm -hmm. as opposed to regulation, not to suggest that regulation are not laws, but we don't draft regulations, we draft statutes. So it's interesting that, that you put such em emphasis and have consistently through the day on focusing on the impact of regulatory encroachment or regulatory development uh, on state law, and that's a, that's a good box to check for us prospectively. Uh, but what about my second? Right. Question? So now I'll get to that. So on that, um, I think in part, so one of the, some of the empirical, so I don't have to purely speculate, one of the empirical findings in this ACUS project was to look, there were a host of issues in which state groups had attempted, they were never consulted when they should have been by the relevant federal, uh, under the federalism executive order about preemptive rulemaking, et cetera. But there were also instances where there had been outreach and then there was silence. You know, there was nothing filed back with the agency. And so the agency could at least use those latter contexts to say, hey, this is a two, two way street, right? So you can point to places, and I think there were numerous ones where the federal agents agencies really were not interested in what these uh, state interest groups had to say and the like. And so to that, you know, I think at least it makes it, they could be engaged in, as you put it, this kind of uh, war by attrition, but it makes it certainly easy if the players don't even show up. So if there is outreach, and part of the ACUS proposal was trying to, as I said earlier, catch some of the low-hanging fruit by letting the federal agencies just know who are the big seven, who are the contact people, right. keeping updated lists and the like trying to argue in favor of this uh, AG notification provision, et cetera. But um, if you don't show up or play in that process, then it makes it a little bit uh, easier for them to win this war of attrition. The, the harder question, I think, and I mean, I had numerous agency officials talk to me um, sort of off record on this, is they said there's certain groups from whom we get value added, and so they're going to actually help make our regulations be better. And there are others who just, I can tell you what they're going to say, and they could just write a memo and say it every time, and it's not going to affect any of our regulation. And I think that's a real problem. And it gets so how to, do you get on the good list, well, and how do you wind up on the yeah, bad list? Yeah, but it gets to my colleague Rick Hill's question, which is, you know, it's sort of abstract principles to which everybody could agree, putting those before federal regulators, I don't think is going to advance the ball in terms of getting no, better and, and, federal regulation. And, and, and I think, I think, I hope everyone understands that the, the, that the that the reason we construct these abstract, you know, rules is because that's frankly, perhaps what we're best at doing as a consensus building organization that is bipartisan. I don't think we can or should or want to stick our finger in anyone's eye. We may have individually strong views about a particular approach. But I think what we're trying to do is talk uh, here and hopefully tomorrow some in our committee meeting about how you translate those principles into real muscle. Uh, one thing I want to ask uh, Michael is if you look at these issues, as you've noted earlier in your, in your comments, about the need for engagement and energy um, at the AG level, you know, I, I work in my state a lot. I work with my governor and I work with clients resources continue to be a significant issue. So the skeptic in me, and the reason I kept talking about a war of attrition is you've got a federal government, a federal infrastructure, lots of resources, or maybe not, but certainly more than, than some state AG's offices or internal regulatory agencies have. You know, how do you make uh, this sort of outreach a priority, either funding or work item for already overburdened attorney general's offices and others? No, that's a great question. I think, you know, my gut reaction to that is to think about the way that we have come to manage resources in the amicus context. So it's the, it's the most, I think, sort of ready analog that's there. So what's happened there over the last 15 years or so? Well, there was, there was this problem. Some states have a lot of resources to vote to, the, you know, to writing amicus briefs representing the state interests in the U.S. Supreme Court, federal appellate courts, 
state Supreme Courts at times. Others really have very little, and that remains true to this day. So if you look and see who's authoring the multi-state amicus briefs, you'll find that it's, it's a minority of the states that doing mo much of the amicus briefing in the US Supreme Court. Those are states that have those resources and they've chosen to dedicate them to that project. And I think what you're describing is something similar. I imagine that there will be some states that have the wherewithal, both because it's a priority, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis their other uh, their other projects, and also just the luxury of some additional resources, to take the lead more often on issues, say, involving federal regulatory preemption. My sense would be, and this is again just sort of my off the cuff, is that if if we imagine a world in which notice is sort of perfect to the attorneys general and they're aware of what's coming in the way they are for obvious reasons in the 75 to 80 cases that go to the US Supreme Court a year, if they were able to do that and there were a mechanism, um, a, a consensus mechanism, perhaps a national mechanism, NAG or elsewhere for identifying those cases, those, those pending regulations that are going to be of the most import um, to the states, I suspect what you'd see is there's something very similar. You'd have some states taking the lead with notice and comment letters, and then you'd have um, circulation and seeing if those letters are joined by other states. So you'd minimize the output of resources by states that don't have them for that purpose or haven't dedicated them for that purpose. Right. But you'd have states taking the lead in the same way that this has developed over the last couple of decades in the amicus front. Let, let me ask the senator, um, uh, particularly through the perspective of, of CSG, uh, in terms of what you've heard today and, and how we're you know, trying to distill some of that, how do you see, or what do you see as the, the role that organizations like the Uniform Law Commission can play uh, with CSG? We identified several years ago a handful, we actually identified during uh, President Martha Walters' uh, tenure as president of the conference, I think a list of 15 to 20 organizations that we thought we could better engage with. The, the, the reality is we, we don't have the resources at the time to engage with that many, but, but but there were at least three or four that were very natural partners for us in this dialogue. Since we are an organization that both draft law and seek enactment of law, uh, to at the top of the list was CSG and NCSL. I mean, do you have a sense as to what uh, an organization like the ULC or your or other uh, uh, state organizations can do to to better coordinate the dialogue, and not just the dialogue, but frankly, an action plan as it relates to federalism issues? Well, I think it's, it's really important and entirely uh, something that, that could be done. And I think we should be working closer among our organizations like NC7 and CSG. I mean, it shouldn't be just one of us charging down. Right. We should all be together on this. I, I guess as we've talked, I've realized that uh, First, our legislators uh, need to be helped. They need some education, and they need to understand uh, this whole issue. But further than that, they need to understand what they can't do. And I don't think a lot of legislators really know that. I mean, we have seen the most bizarre pieces of legislation. I mean, there was a piece of the legislation in Alaska that said if a federal officer tried to arrest someone on a, on a gun control law, uh, no one in the state could help them. And in fact, if they did, they'd be liable to... to uh, a felony charge. I mean, it's it just, I mean, you, you know that that is going nowhere, that it's never going to be uh, approved at any level. So I think we have to help each other uh, as legislators to know what we cannot be doing, what we should not be doing, and what we're just tilting at windmills and not accomplishing anything. And then the more important issue is what can we do? How can we work together? How can we help each other out? How can uh, various organizations come to us and help our legislators understand what they can do? And, and, uh, and we do have a good relationship with our state legislators. And that, that I mean, our, our, our members of Congress, and, uh, and that's a valuable piece. We had the senator here today, and that, that's good that Idaho has that connection with them, right. uh, as we do with uh, our, our, our congressman from Alaska. So a lot can be done, and uh, we need to try to figure out uh, what we can do. Well, one, one phrase you use which, uh, which resonates with me is the, the concept of avoiding tilting at windmills. It seems to me, um, in order to be most effective, we can't do everything, but what we need to do is assess what our respective strengths are and how we can best integrate those and, and frankly identify which among us can be most potent and most useful. What we have found through the Uniform Law Commission, and Judge Mize referenced this earlier uh, uh, t today, was the ability uh, on the Convention on Choice of Courts to uh, use our respective organizations, the Conference of Chief Justices and the Uniform Law Commission, to, to state uh, very strongly our continued commitment to cooperative federalism
and not only do that as state organizations, but frankly reach out to our congressional delegations in a way that was extremely helpful. Senator Risch and my senator, one of my two senators, Senator Coons on the Foreign Relations Committee. So it's sort of, as I think about it, it's canvassing your resources and it's determining where you can be most useful and realizing you can't do everything as much as we would like to try to do everything. Um, I guess I, I wanted to just uh, move on quickly to some perhaps uh, more academic uh, pieces of the earlier discussion that I just found uh, personally fascinating. And since I'm sitting up here moderating, I guess I get to ask these questions. This notion of a federal instrumentality, and while it sounds like and, and is, at least to me, a bit of an arcane idea, I was curious as to whether or not there are other examples in a modern context beyond banking. And, and uh, Catherine, I'm looking at you because you're the one person who was on the panel who's sitting here, although I'm sure other I'm people... I'm looking at Rick. Well, Rick, <laughs> I'm going to invite Rick to, 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 to jump up. Whether in areas like environmental regulation or energy or communication and technology, are there... Are there other examples that perhaps we who are cognizant and aware of these federalism issues, and we're all being proselytized appropriately to be aware of it, should we be on the lookout, so to speak, for other issues where this could be a problem or, or is a resurgence from uh, uh, the federal side of the equation? Or is it something we should even worry about or, con or, or concern ourselves over? So it was the barely building a loan that caused all this problem. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. Sort of, I mean, securities exchanges for a time had that, right? Where they would issue, and then it was federally mandated that the, the, the security, the, own, the exchange's own rules were deemed, I think, to have, if I'm not mistaken, to have that effect. But I'm not, I don't know if that's. So it sounds to me like the, the, the principal issue has been really the, 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 as I understand it, your view that there has been a, re, a revitalization of the arguments by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency trying to hang on, so to speak in the current environment. I guess the other thing that I wanted to ask you specifically, Catherine, I think this is fairly directed to you, is um, the, the, uh, the shift, and it came up in the context of uh, uh, in, a shift in, uh, in deference under Dodd-Frank uh, to the OCC from the broader Chevron to the narrower Skidmore standard. And I remember from the last symposium, a lot of discussion about the standards that are applied in, in this context. Is the difference, uh, one that is simply a function of particular language in Dodd-Frank? And if it is, is, does that in and of itself indicate any uh, broader shift in that standard of deference? Uh, or is it a leap to think that we're going to get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, that, it's a great question. I'm, uh, I have, I'm writing a paper right now, so I've been giving some academic workshops uh, before different settings, and it's interesting. because the academic people... workshops, that's what they do. Yeah, right, so <laughs> or we knock on each other. But no, there's a group that thinks that everything Congress was doing in Dodd-Frank was directed to the OCC and how aggressive it had been on preemption and changing the standard. But I take the view that you know, obviously what they were doing in Dodd-Frank with provisions looking to 
OCC, they were doing that, but there are developments. So, for example, I mentioned the Wyeth versus Levine, right. the U.S. Supreme Court case, where the court um, talks about the not giving deference to the FDA because of these procedural abnormalities, et cetera. And if you look, so I did a project that looked at all of the drug litigation. Uh, there was a huge divide, actually a really interesting distinction between federal and state courts. Federal courts were more likely to give Chevron deference to the preemption preamble of the FDA than state courts. A lot of people say, oh, well, what, what explains that? If you teach tort law, you understand what explains that because state courts have something called the regulatory compliance defense, which is never giving absolute immunity, and they right. see preemption as a blunter form. A lot of the state court opinions were written citing regulatory compliance defense cases, whereas the federal courts were looking to some overly broad language about giving deference you know, to agencies under Chevron. But there was another interesting fact, which comes back to you know, who's playing this game. The FDA was more likely to intervene in federal versus state cases, and federal courts were more likely to call for the views of the FDA than the state courts were. So they were getting, you know, here are state and federal courts both interpreting the same federal statute and kind of applying different uh, frameworks to the question. So I think there's a broader uh, issue afoot. I think the U.S. Supreme Court is very conflicted about this issue of how much deference to give to agencies. If you look at some of the more recent, after Wyeth versus Levine, uh, there's a case. So Wyeth versus Levine is a, a drug case dealing with brand name manufacturers where they found that there was not preemption. Then the court decided a case called Mensing versus Pliva where they said for generics there is preemption and Justice Thomas writes that opinion and there they give deference to the FDA's interpretation of its own regulations but not the FDA's bottom line position on preemption. There's a case pending right now that's a second generic drug case where the U.S. government now, the FDA has said there should be preemption. So the whole sort of how much deference the courts are going to give both the interpretive position of the agency and then something if we move to sort of asking for a factual record, how they review that, I think is a extremely important issue that goes well beyond what Congress did, you know, in Dodd-Frank. So this will get sorted out through litigation, ultimately. Yeah, I think I mean, sorted that. out in terms of, uh, we can talk about trying to change the landscape through congressional action. You can be vigilant on an ongoing basis with respect to federal regulatory issues. But in terms of defining the scope of preemption, I mean, the final arbiters, I guess, ultimately are going to be the courts. Well, and this is, but this is back to, so to get more academic about it, right, we've got Congress agencies and courts. So Congress could answer many of these questions directly. They could be crystal clear when they write express preemption provisions. They almost never are. Right? Even right. Mike asked for express preemption so you could get more notice. You know, there are express preemption provisions that are written in the most opaque way. So you know the issues on the yeah. table. Yep. But I think Congress has been punting for a long time to agencies and to courts. So right. courts inevitably are answering these. What was interesting in Dodd-Frank is it's quite unique for Congress, I think, to come in and not only set up a, to set up a standard of judicial review. I mean, that's quite unique. So they went that far. Right. And I think they were getting support from some movements uh, afoot. Now, whether that means you have to just step back. I mean, talk about education. I mean, judges actually do call so for education. I've sat on panels. New York has an interesting state and federal courts come together the way these groups do, and they ask for panels to come. One of the issues right. before them a lot is preemption. I just I talked to lots of different judges groups about this issue because they're handling lots of cases about it, and many of them feel like they need some education about these kinds um, of I, issues. I cut you off. I didn't mean to. No, I, and I'll, maybe I'll get less academic than more academic, but, uh, but I think this goes, uh, again, and circles back around to sort of what we were talking about before, which is in these preemption cases, at least a sub, you know, and let's, even the ones that all the way go all the way to the Supreme Court, at least a subset of the justices, and particularly Justice Breyer, um, cares a great deal about what the agency says, not even about agency deference or rulemaking, but about whether or not there is a conflict here. Um, uh, and, you know, you would say, may say that other justices honor that in some cases and not in other cases. Breyer, like I said, is probably the one who's, who's consistent. But this again, is, you know, there are any number of cases where you have this feeling that, um, you know, there was an opportunity to influence the views of the United States um, that may or may not have occurred. And I can 
you know, from my experience in any number of cases, that discussion sort of never occurred about, okay, is what this what is going on in state court, what the state is trying to do, how state court law, state tort law is operating, is does it really cause a problem? Is there really a conflict there? And like I said, some of it's going to depend on, depend on the people who are there about how they think about it is the least technical little problem, uh, a true inconsistency or a true conflict. And I, and I go back around, you asked for what could we do differently or better? And I right. do, I think I agree with Rod a little bit, that, with Rick a little bit, that um, the statements of principles don't really take you very far. As a federal official, if I got a statement of principles, you know, it was I would put it in a file folder, but that would be the max you would get out of it, really, because I just had too much to do. Right. Um, but if you got together with a number of, with some of the other groups and colleagues and, and, and said, what are five areas of regulation that are deeply important to the states? And you know, we think we do those better, right? Let us get ourselves on a long-term trajectory where we are going to engage with the regulators and say, here are the five areas we want, we're gonna focus on. Um, you have your team set up in whatever structure you have, and we're gonna work on those. You know, we're gonna work with ULC to come up with uniform legislation that's gonna implement what, the way we wanna do this because we think the states are gonna do better. And you need to make room, you, know, you say it nicer than that, you need to make room in federal <laughs> law for us to be able to do that. And let's work out a sensible system together. You know, you're gonna, are you gonna bat 100%? No. Uh, but I think there are opportunities there, um, but I do think it requires you to actually, you know, maybe not deal with the most hot button issues of, of DOMA and, you know, religious liberty or whatever, but right. here are core -ish areas of regulation that are of deep concern to the states uh, and, and localities, and there's an opportunity there. Mike? Well, well I tend to think, and, and this may be, you know, too, too much sort of the wide-eyed optimist, but I do tend to think, to build on your point, that on some of these less hot button issues, if there were more data, more knowledge about the role the states properly play in a given circumstance and about the potential friction between a proposed reg and what the states are doing, my, my suspicion is you might get consensus where in the absence of that data or that knowledge, it's much harder to build consensus because people are more inclined to sort of retreat to their first principles. And so I think that builds on your point that if, if, we, if we select a few and pour information into them, um, you know, perhaps we reach consensus where we might not otherwise. And I think it, there are sort of long term, I'll, I'll take the Arizona immigration case as, a, as an example, although not the best example, but, but there was a case where you had nine justices who I bet if you interviewed each one of them separately would have a completely different view about what it is that local police officers actually have to do with the enforcement of immigration law. Um, and a big chunk of that case was everybody trying to educate them in sort of different ways. Um, you know, and I think there is a, you know, pick a different area of regulation, which I think is probably, you know, uh, immigration is not necessarily the best example. Uh, you know, if you could get to a point where the, the states and the federal government actually had, you know, worked together to develop sort of a consistent approach that really uh, was, uh, uh, I think, consistent with the kind of principles that you're trying to develop here, um, you show up at the Supreme Court with a very different record and a very different set of advocacy and I think a much big, better opportunity to have uh, the state equities heard. And, and just, and sorry. Affirmed. Go ahead. No, I, I completely agree. And if you want to see that in kind of a smaller form, you look at the amicus briefing that exists now and some of the more technical cases. Um, this, this is occasionally what's doing, You're, you know, what these amicus briefs are doing either from the states or in a completely, you know, in a commercial case, it may be from the patent bar, from engineers, and what they're, they're educating, because otherwise there is that high risk that there'll be nine different sort of real world views on the part of the justices. And to catch that earlier and to do it in the rulemaking process, make it part of the administrative record so much better than having to do that at the, in the U.S. Supreme Court in the form of an amicus brief. Um, I wanted to ask one more question and then open uh, the floor up. I, I would like to deliver uh, the end of the day at five o'clock sharp, if possible, and I, I don't think anybody will object up here if I try to do that. Uh, we, we've spent a lot of time today pointing out examples where federalism doesn't work, where there's a dysfunctionality, where there's a lack of communication, uh, and Catherine, again, I'm going to impose upon you. C can you can you point to something where it does work? It, it, is there a circumstance where uh, it's it's right or almost right, where the balance seems to almost be what it should be? Yeah, um, 
I'm kind of good at ducking most of your really hard questions. Thank you. But, um, uh, no, in the in the ACUS report, I mentioned before the different federal agencies that I went to, and I thought EPA, certainly with respect to implementation of the federalism executive order, had given the most thought to it over time, had internal guidelines in place, had sort of manuals, books, things that they would give out to um, people who were writing regulations, et cetera, had a whole network of groups they met with systematically from the states, uh, seemed like a much more robust sort of cooperative federalism model than any of the other agencies that I was going to. The problem, and I alluded to this quickly when I was speaking before, is it's very, very different because the EPA considers the states co-regulators in this area. And There's by a lot necessity, of delegated authority. Yeah, they have right. to be doing that. Nonetheless, I right. thought, so some people said, so therefore they're not a model, but there were certain things they had done internally that I actually thought were good models for other agencies. So in some of the other agencies, for example, where the officials would say, oh yeah, that federalism executive order, we know about it. Just informally, we kind of talk, they had no internal guidelines in the agency. So there were certain things that I think you could learn right. from kind of a model, even if it's a very different model going differently, the way to do outreach to some state groups, the ways in which you try to maximize kind of the value added from some of these groups as opposed to how you determine over time from whence you're getting that value added. So right. I, I thought that was... Uh, uh, I, I agree. EPA, I think, is, is somebody I'm saying. And the other thing is, I mean, you know, we, we are focused on a, a set of issues, preemption law. I mean, you know, my experience, you know, federalism is working wonderfully every single day in the law enforcement context where you have yeah. just tremendous partnerships. And and one thing that I've always felt is, and I, and I you know, this is inconsistent with uh, uh, budgetary constraints, and nor do I think that, you know, you should, federal government should have excess creep, but the agencies like, frankly, DOJ that actually have people who are, uh, you know, out in, you know, out, outside of Washington, and whose job is actually, and this is like the EPA region administrators, and whose job is actually to engage and work collaboratively with, uh, you know, state and local, in my context, law enforcement, there's a much more sort of attuned sense to, let's figure out how we can all do our jobs best together. And it's tougher when you have a, you know, an, an organization that is 99% sort of in Washington, and whose whose mandate is to hear from people when they show up to them, not to sort of be out there with them every day. Right. And, and you know, now that isn't to say that we should then, you know, have, you know, the Department of Education should be in every town in America. No, that's not the right answer. But I do think that culturally you see that in some organizations it works reasonably well. Good point. Interesting observation. I'm going to open the floor up now to questions if anyone has them. Uh, sure. To paraphrase Tip O'Neill's All Politics is Local, uh, all commerce is international at this point. So we're not at a place where, you know, you're going down to the corner store and picking up the fruits that you your your neighbor was growing. You're getting Chilean peaches or you're getting bananas from Panama. Uh, you're uh, I work part time with a small distillery, even the interstate commerce completely changes. You have, you know, Grain coming from one state, potatoes from another state, uh, barrels coming from another state, and it's you know subject to the uh, laws of Virginia for sales purposes. But then we're going to be dealing with a completely different set of laws when you try to sell that product in another state. So, uh, to what extent do we want to maintain the existing responsibilities for states for commerce? when you have issues around the mention of the last panel, like data breaches, where you're not even necessarily dealing with companies based in the United States anymore. If you have something like uh, uh, Siemens wanting to deal with the data breach laws for their products, yet you're dealing with a patchwork of multiple states, where are we going to start drawing these lines to facilitate commerce on an international scale beyond interstate commerce? Anyone? Sounds like we need uniform laws. But this, this, I mean, poses, I think, the broader question of, particularly in the, you know, treaty context, you know, trade agreement treaty context, you know, how you sort of work through the variations in state law in that context, and that's that set of issues is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, um, and more complicated, I think. Um, 
and again, a reason why an organization like this and an effort uh, is incredibly important because I think that um, there are, you know, look, there are opportunities to sort of work with the trade rep and others on, on those kind of issues. But it's a lot easier if you can if you don't have to go in and explain. Well, we got fifty different variations of this. Um, but let me explain how really it won't affect your trade agreement negotiation. You can say, well, you know, we got 49 things that are kind of the same, and then, you know, these crazy people wouldn't pick your state as start doing right. something different, but we can work with this. Um, so I do think that, um, look, we, you know, we're not giving up our constitutional system. And, and you know, although all commerce is global, um, every consumer's problem is intensely local. <laughs> and so I think, you know, we've managed to work through this. It gets more complicated every year. But I, I, I don't think those problems are insurmountable. But I do think it does it puts a premium on efforts like this one to try to find some harmony within the states as best you can. Yes. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, obviously, so we talked about this on the earlier panel, and a lot of the uh, thrust of um, even the ACUS recommendations, I think the thrust of Dodd-Frank's uh, substantial evidence requirement for the OCC is putting focus on the kind of empirical backing, which is all about what's developed in the regulatory record. Now, what's interesting is under Dodd-Frank, right, they're putting that burden or onus on the federal agency. So OCC has to show substantial evidence that it would uh, prevent or significantly 
uh, interfere with the uh, national banking regulatory uh, scheme. But what you're suggesting is, you know, while there's this sort of indeterminacy and these issues are going before court, right. there is a role that these uh, that if you could take on the burden, putting aside resource constraints, which Mike and you talked about, et cetera, to come up with this kind of evidence to show there's no conflict here whatsoever, it would be very worthwhile. I mean, there's a there is there's an interesting way if you read really carefully these U.S. Supreme Court decisions, even Wyatt versus Levine, I'll say, because I mentioned it earlier, the, the drug case earlier, you can read the majority in the dissent, and it's as if they don't really have any fundamental uh, divide, although they do, about preemption. It's about how much attention the FDA gave to particular evidence of the harm. And the majority said they gave no more than passing attention. The dissent says, this was 50 years. And you look, if you look at the amount of the regulatory record before the court, it's not there. So you wonder, OK, litigants could learn from that, but maybe state group could learn from that too, that right. that kind of stuff, even if it's not officially part of their uh, analytic framework is very powerful to how these these issues are decided before court. So I agree. Well, I want to I want to make a final comment on on my side, which is that I uh, one thing is clear to me today from from everything I've heard and observed. Uh, it's sort of the the theme that I take away, uh, and I I hope our uh, the Uniform Law Commission partner organizations do as well. That is that state organizations. Uh, no big secret about this, need to talk more among ourselves. Uh, we need to meet more often. We need to have discussions that are perhaps uh, more effective. And we need to help each other identify our respective strengths and weaknesses and the roles that we can play and the resources that we can efficiently apply to particular issues. I'm a believer in small victories on small issues, building a uh, a record of success and not trying to do too much. If we try to do too much, we'll do nothing. So I, I want to come away from this, at least uh, committing the Uniform Law Commission, to trying to develop a, a construct for more regular and more useful meeting, Senator. And I, I know we will work on that together with you and other organizations. I am very pleased to know that there is a, uh, a multi-year commitment on the part of CSG to focus on federalism. We've been at this now at our conference for at least four to six years. And I know we have another four year or so commitment on this as well. Uh, we need to make uh, that discourse about efficiency and integration um, a, a priority for all of us, and I hope we do. It's about 5 o'clock. Boy, it's almost 1 before 5. That's amazing. I want to um, uh, conclude the symposium. I want to ask us all to express our appreciation to the speakers and panelists today. I want to thank all of you for sticking with us uh, through this very long uh, but interesting day, uh, and we are adjourned. <laughs>